Hey, good morning. Welcoming everyone in. Ken Woods, hello. Hi, Kip. Hi, Linda Clark. Hi, Sandy Sauerbeck and Joan Riggs. Good morning to you all. Welcome to uh, March 13th, 2023. And uh, snowy day here in southeastern Michigan. Although it's not going to it's not going to accumulate, but it's going to snow pretty much all day, we think. Hi, Larry and Carolyn Thomas. How are you? Scott Johnson, good morning. Yep. Got folks coming in. Hi, Don Jones. Good morning to you. I hope you all had a really good Sunday. Saw many of you uh, in person on Sunday in worship. And, uh, I had a full day yesterday. Got my, you got your, you got your value out of me yesterday. We did a lot. We were uh, wonderful. Finished it up with a, a wonderful showing of the film Encanta, which is uh, kind of a, it's an animated Disney film. It was very nice. I actually sat there and watched the whole thing, and it's unusual for something to keep my attention for that long. Hi, Robin Allen. Good morning to you. Hope the weather's good for everybody. Hey, Sherry Keys, how are you? Good morning. Good to see you here with us today. We missed you too. So as we get going here, some of the news. We don't have a lot going on because we're in Lent, right? So, um, all right, Don, we'll make sure we we uh, we pray for you on that one. Hi, Helen England. Norma Bentley, good morning. Hi, Nancy. How are you? So anyway, so today uh, we'll start off. We've got a session meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, on Zoom. If you were a session member, you're going, I, don't, I haven't seen anything. It's going to be a little bit late. All the stuff will come out, but it's going to be a little bit late. Uh, our uh, clerk of session, clerk, clerk to the session, Andrea Carlson, um, just been traveling and everything. So she's a little bit behind. So we'll get there. Hi, Mary, Aunt Mary, Ken Woods. It is the Ides of March. Yes, if you remember that. Hi, Barry and Margo, Barbara Wolf. So, um, and then also at noontime today, uh, via Zoom, we're having our finance committee for the month. So those are things that are going on. Of course, we have grief share on Thursday. And, um, but what is today, right? So I was looking around. So there's two things I have to tell you that are uh, significant today. The first one is, it is 313 Day. Do you know what that is? It's celebration of the Detroit 313 area code. So it's March 13th, 313, same as that area code. And that area code is getting filled up. They're not actually going to release any more numbers off of it. Um, I think it's starting this summer or something. They got to bring in another area code. We just so anyway, so uh, 313 day. And it's also, this is the one that I like even better. It's National Napping Day. Do you know that? So the day, the Monday after the uh, daylight saving time change is National Napping Day. So I have to see. The president's on the TV right now. Okay. Yeah. That, I, I will admit that. You know, it's all concerning when we're starting to see two bank failures now, and I'm sure they're trying to reassure everybody that it's not 2008 all over again. And man, I really hope not. It took my retirement account a long time to recover from 2008. And that was all right, because I'm like, it's a ways before retirement. But now, now it feels a little, a little bit more concerning. Hi, Joanne Butters. Good to see you. Hi, Judy Martin. So I'll have to follow up on that and watch the watch what President Biden has to say. Are you guys ready to get moving? It is 9.03, so we'll move over here to our devotions. And there's so much going on in our own personal lives and the lives of our country and the world, right? So let's push. We're not going to ignore it, but we're going to push that stuff off to the side so we can listen to God's word for us today. And in order to do that, I do my breathing exercises. I breathe in for five, hold it for five, and exhale for five. I'd welcome you into this with me. Here we go. Are you ready? All right. Come, Lord Jesus. 
Oh, more Jesus. Okay. Go over here. All right. And our opening devotion today is Psalm 119, verses 73 through 80. Let's listen for the word of the Lord for us today. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have humbled me. Let your steadfast love become my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame, because they have subverted me with guile. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, so that they may know your decrees. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, so that I may not be put to shame. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. You know, there's some people that feel that this is a pastoral prayer for, for, for people who serve. Right? Not just for ministers, but for people who serve. And um, um, as I read that, you know, everything has a purpose. And uh, it's all different for us all. So what I say here doesn't mean that, it, that it's true for you, but what's, tr what's true for me when we read things like this. But where God grabbed a hold of me, right, and, um, and uh, shook me, right, was that in faithfulness you have humbled and then it talks about the arrogant. So this sense of pride and egotism, uh, egotistical uh, living is really a problem um, for people and their relationship with God. And, and um, so um, there's so much going on with it, right? But anyway, but that you have humbled me. We need to understand that sometimes when we're humbled, means we're taken down a couple rungs on the ladder that's good for us, right? Because it demonstrates what we really do control and, and um, what we really do need to depend on. So humble is great if you can accomplish that yourself, but sometimes God takes you down a few notches just to prove it to you, and you have to have an open mind to understand it, right? Or otherwise you just get mad. So let's go on here and read... Um, our prophetic reading, we're con continuing on in Jeremiah. This is chapter 7, and uh, so um, this is happening at a time before the fall of the southern kingdom, right? Um, but uh, 537 uh, BC, but uh, after the fall of the northern kingdom. And Jeremiah is... Um, getting the word of the Lord to change things or else things are going to turn out much the same as what happened for the northern kingdom. And Josiah is king. And we do know um, through, uh, is it in First and Second Kings also, I think? Anyway, uh, the events that Jeremiah talks about is also we get another um, look at them over there. I'll have to look that up and I'll tell you about that tomorrow. So if you want to do a little bit more research. So here you are. They're trying to recover, right? Um, they're trying to reform um, their understanding of God. And uh, we'll hear a little bit more about it. Here we go. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 15. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah. That's the southern kingdom. You that enter these gates to worship the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Right? For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly with one another. If you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. 
here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called my, by my name, and say we are safe, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people of Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, says the Lord, and when I spoke to you persistently, you do not listen, and when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place that I gave you and to your ancestors, just as I did to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, just as I cast out all your kinsfolk, all the offspring of Ephraim. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So there, there was two places of worship before the establishment of the temple in Jerusalem under David. Well, the temple wasn't there. The temple was built under David's son, um, but Solomon. But... Um, Worship centered around Jerusalem in the time of David. He brought the tabernacle there. Before that, there was two places, Shechem and Silo, uh, Shiloh. And Shiloh, uh, because it, the, the, it became perverted. Uh, when I say perverted, it, they, they became, uh, what do they call it? They melded their worship of God with the worship that the native people, this worship of Baal. So uh, saying, don't do this, right? Don't do this. And it happened up north and see what I did. That's Ephraim. I scattered them. You know, get yourself right here. And don't just give me, um, don't just say these things. You've got to live these things. And it gives specific examples. And if we always want to wonder, because we can look at the Old Testament. And we can say, boy, that's a different God. That's a very vengeful God that uh, destroys and everything. But. However, and that's true, we see much more of that in the Old Testament, but we also hear this, that we don't, do not, right? If, amend your ways, act justly with one another. Don't oppress the alien, the people that's in your midst, right? The orphan, the widow, don't shed innocent blood, no violence, right? And, and don't go after other gods, right? Do these things and I will be with you. God wants to remember that difficult stuff, right, the other day. So, but here we go. Let's read what he has to say today. This uh, church <clears throat> community in Rome that he's trying to, uh, maybe he's trying to impress them. But he's got a big ask of them. So, sorry I'm going to sneeze. Or not. All right, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him, who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned by, er, as righteousness. So also David speaks of the blessedness of those who come for those to whom God reckons righteousness, irrespective of works. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. In this blessedness, then, pronounced only on the circumcision. I'm sorry. I'm on the verge of a sneeze, so it becomes difficult. Is this blessedness then pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? We say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? If it was not, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. This purpose was to make him the ancestor of all who believed without being circumcised and 
who thus have righteousness reckoned to them, and likewise the ancestor of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also follow the example of the faith that our ancestor Abraham had before he was circumcised. So ends this reading of the word of law. That's a lot of circumcision that we're talking about here. What does it mean, right? What is this physical act of circumcision, this marking, right, this removal? Um, so it's a purely Jewish rite, and he's making the argument as he has in previous letters, right, because he had people that were coming after him that are saying salvation through Christ is only for the Jewish people. So if you want to participate in it, you have to become Jewish, which means that if you're male, you need to be circumcised. And he called these the Judaizers, right? And he doesn't believe this for a moment, and he's making this argument to the people in Rome, don't believe that, and here's my argument. He's saying, well before circumcision became um, uh, a requirement of being Jewish, the forefathers, right, were they, are we going to see them in the kingdom of heaven? And they're saying yes, because it tells us in Scripture that the righteousness, their righteousness was reckoned to them, right? Um, their actions, their the way that they live. But we need, but he has to be careful because this puts what we call a works uh, uh, grace into play, which means that you have to do these things in order to prove to God, right, that you're that you're um, you're willing. So and then and then salvation is put on those people who do that work, right? Or you just say no. This is just a, a, a graceful act by God to extend it to him. And if it's extended to us, we should be doing these works, right? So that's the two different ways of looking at it. And it used to be that, that the Catholic Church taught this works. You need to do these works. But even then, have, even the Catholic Church has backed off on that a bit. And, it, and actually, it's a very Protestant. It was one of the foundations of the Protestant uh, it's salvation by faith and by faith alone. That's what the, the Protestant Reformation says. Okay, let's move on to Gospels, the Gospel readings. And we're in Gospel of John, in uh, 7th chapter, verses 14 through 36. This is always difficult on, not difficult, it's a little bit more difficult on Mondays because we miss some days of reading these things, so... We're kind of picking up stories sometimes, not in their completion, but in midway through the story. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens here. So uh, we're going to see Jesus is in Jerusalem for a festival. Okay. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. About the middle of the festival, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews were astonished at it, saying, How does this man have such learning? when he has never been taught. Then Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. Those who speak on their own seek their own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is nothing false in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why are you looking for an opportunity to kill me? Um, I'm going to pause right there. So, um, one of the ways that they were trying to catch Jesus was the fact that he was healing on the Sabbath, right? And a few other things. So they said, you know, and he's, he's pointing out the hypocrisy of bringing him up on those charges when they themselves don't even keep the law, right? Okay. The crowd answered him, you have a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus answered them, I performed one work, and all of you are astonished. Moses gave you circumcision. It is, of course, not from Moses, but from the patriarchs, and you circumcise in a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath in order that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I healed a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Now, some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Is not this man the man whom they are trying to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, but they say nothing to him. 
Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? Yet we know where this man is from. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he was teaching in the temple, You know me, and you know where I am from. I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true, and you do not know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Then they tried to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many in the crowd believed him and were saying, When the Messiah comes, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will search for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then Jesus said to the Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that he will not that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying you will search for me and you will not find me? And where am I where I am, you cannot come. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. So again, this is more positioning of the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is. Um, we're going to see who we are in Jesus. Uh, uh, and, but we can see here this reliance, again, seems to be a circumcision type of day. So we see this uh, reliance on the law that God puts down, including circumcision, and the hypocrisy that's being pointed out. We saw it in Paul's letter to the Romans that we just read, but we're also seeing it right here in John. So the law doesn't save, right? It's faith in God that saves. And uh, so I think that's the lesson that we're learning here. And Jesus is speaking of the, the kingdom to come, right? You'll search for me and not find me, right? He's going to go away for a little while, right? I'm going to be with you a little while longer, then I'm going to go away. He's speaking about his death and then his resurrection, of course. All right, let's go back over, see if we have any notes. Barry and Margo, thank you very, very much for putting that up. Appreciate that. Oh, I'm sorry, Dorcas Circle is Tuesday at 1 in the parlor. Thank you very much, and good morning, Ann Winslow. Good to see you. Hi, Tracy Crutz, good to see you today, too. Hi, Barbara Shoot. good morning. Andrea Seabloom, good morning to you. Hi, Norma Bentley. You're welcome, Barbara Wolf. All right, here we go. All right, are you ready to pray? We need to pray for a few things specifically and in general, right? Just this. We're going to pray for peace and patience, right? Healing, all of those things. Let's pray. Heavenly Lord, thank you for uh, being with us as we opened up your word and read it today. We open up this week continuing on our studies in Lent where we're trying to draw closer to you to have a better understanding of the the true uh, action of God and the resurrection of your son Jesus Christ. Lord, we can't wait for Easter, but uh, be with us as we continue to sojourn through Lent. And as we gather today, there's a few things that are forefront in our mind that we want to lift up. Lord, we pray for Don Shanley and, and, um, and healing for him. Lord, we pray for um, Don Jones as he travels to the doctor today, and many, many more people, Lord, that are in need of healing. So anyone, anyone who is not feeling well, anyone who is in the process of being treated in the hospital, Lord, guide all of their health care workers so that they will uh, come to full health uh, quickly. And Lord, uh, we, and, uh, we know that healing takes many forms, and so what we do pray for is that we will have a peace and a comfort as we undergo all of the healing that you are constantly doing, Lord, and know that it's your will, and we pray all of this in your name. We also pray for the world. We pray for uh, the dysfunction in the world, and Lord, uh, there's a lot of concern about the banking industry. Lord, we've lived through this, and uh, we don't care to go through it again. If there's any way that you can guide our leaders so that they can prevent uh, anything of more significance than what has happened happened, Lord, we would pray that you would that you would just uh, bless them with your presence. But Lord, we do live in a land that we tend to build up our own gods, 
and we try to rely on them. And then when they do ultimately will fail us, we feel lost. So, um, Lord, let us always have a faith that always relies on you. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for this uh, community of faith that you've given us in the Allen Park Presbyterian Church and the many new ways that it goes out and reaches people. Lord, let all who come here grant them rest, grant them assurance, and Lord, grant them strength. We do ask all of this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Amen all. God bless you all. I love you. God loves you. We all love you here in Allen Park Presbyterian Church. Let us show you how. So uh, have a great day in the Lord, and we'll see you right back here 9 a.m. tomorrow morning for daily news and devotions. God bless you all. Have a great nap day. Bye-bye.